Okay. <clears throat> okay. So um, anyway, I'm preparing uh, to uh, show Paul some of the ancient tools of ignorance. Um, this is a NPR a clear camera. It was uh, a step up for uh, for filmmakers, for image makers, for storytellers, when most people uh, still had to depend on big, huge cameras to tell stories that people who can own and afford big, huge cameras can tell. Don Caselis used the NPR clear in medium cool uh, because they told him to, <laughs> because it was a camera that I was using. And uh, in the film, um, a lot of of John Caselis has some of my uh, good and some of my bad traits. Um, one of them, um, one of them, Mariana Hill mentions uh, when uh, they're in a bedroom scene, and she called him a um, egotistical, self-centered cameraman. Punchy cameraman. Punchy cameraman. It feels a lot heavier. I don't know whether it feels heavier because I am 50 years older than I had it before. But uh, generally, uh, this is the usual zoom, zoom lens. We had 25 to 250. Usually we took a little stick and put it up here, and this zooms in in a considerable range. A really good part about this camera was that you didn't have to thread the camera the way you did with other cameras, so you could work quickly. This magazine allow, is, has 400 feet of film in it, which you have to load up in a change bag. And then when you're shooting, here's the gate right here. And then this, this goes on here, snaps on like this. And uh, then you make pictures. The ability to put a fresh magazine, 10 minutes of film, on a camera quickly also allowed you to work cinema verite style. Because the best shots usually in cinema verite uh, always was when you're out of film. You'd be able to actually not even turn the camera off and have another load there and snap it on while it's running. To begin with, you were connected with an umbilical cord. And that cord gave you the sync system to the, to the sound. But then uh, with the um, advent of Crystal, uh, you were able to work independently without an umbilical cable was, was possible uh, because of crystal control. That is, inside this watch is a tuning fork, and that tuning fork oscillates at 60 cycles. And 60 cycles, if the camera is set up for 60 cycles, and the recorder is also 60 cycles, when you hit a microphone, you're able to get sync. You'll notice a lot of documentary films made that way. The camera is sort of moving like that because it moves over for the sound man to hit the microphone. It was a good handheld camera. You'll see that Forster got pretty good with holding it. And of course, I, um, the, the lens, he, I wasn't so sure about him, and he was in a lot of wild places. So I put a um, really a not too good a lens on the front of this camera, uh, but I don't think anyone knows that. Actually, it was a, a lens, uh, also a French ingenue, 32 to 140, rather than the usual 10 to 1. And actually, news people at that time didn't use that camera. That's a little adjustment that I made with reality. In 63, for example, when I shot the bus, there weren't, as there is now, hundreds of cameras. Or even in 68, when we shot medium cool, Cameras were usually on tripods. There weren't a lot of handheld cameras on at all because they were not considered reliable and not the quality or what they were used to at the, um, at the big networks. Amongst NPR owners and amongst just cinema verite people, the, the, pleasure, the pleasure of having something uh, that's small and portable and, 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 and actually affordable, they weren't that expensive compared to other, other cameras, um, was something that they had in common and that to put it on a tripod 
uh, made it feel like uh, a different thing, less verite, you know, less uh, in touch closely the device with what you're shooting. The camera that I shot medium cool with was the 35 millimeter French camera made by a Claire called the CM3. This CM3 is the original CM3, and it had uh, a divergent turret. That means you put three lenses on it, and it go like this. And this is an unusual thing, because, because of the angle of the divergent turret, the, the lenses did not interfere with each other. In other words, if you, if you have a if you have a, a, lo a long lens here, shooting, this is the shooting side, and then you flip it up like this, and, and then uh, like that, then, um, then they won't interfere with one another. And inside here is a mirror, a rotating mirror, and that allows the camera to be reflex, because at that time, 35 millimeter king cameras had um, had parallax, and just to be able to look through the lens while shooting was a big breakthrough. The gate on this thing is here, like that, and um, that over time we changed them in development. It's two frame pull down, so the images were the images were pretty steady, and it also has the ability. To, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take another um, Eclair body out to show you this. This is the motor that runs it, and the film is inside here. This is sort of an adaptation that I made shortly on to uh, allow for a PL mount. This allows you to use all the same lenses that are used on Aeroflex. This also is a lighter weight motor guy in Switzerland made for this camera. The advantages of this camera over, say, the Mitchell or any other cameras is that it was reflex and it could be used handheld. Normally, 400-foot magazine like this would, be, would snap on to the CM3 like that, and then you're ready to shoot. Of course, you have to be connected to a battery, which I'm not going to wear right now. But this is pretty much the way uh, medium cool was shot. You don't want to be wedded to a 400-foot magazine. So I was in the Paramount machine shop, and I had them make this. This is a 1,000-foot magazine um, that would fit on a CM3. And um, it was. This is, these two here are the only one existing in the world. <laughs> and um, and the, the machine shop guys at Paramount, uh, they thought of me as kind of weird, but I guess they were interested in me. So they really put their minds to doing this. The one side, this hasn't been opened up in 45 years, so, you know. <laughs> The one, the one side, uh, this, is, this is opening up a coaxial 1,000-foot magazine for the CM3. So the film would go in here, and you see there's padding in here to keep, to keep the sound down as well. And then the film would go out through here and out for the front right here. And this gets snapped on to the, um, that gets snapped on to the front of the CM3. The attributes of this camera compared to the Aeroflex, which was also portable handheld, it was the, actually it was the German combat camera. My first Aeroflex uh, was on was Victor Solo, a cameraman in New York, um, bought got this camera uh, his Aeroflex off a dead German. <laughs> And I bought it from him on a troop ship that I was a sailor on going back from Europe. So that was the Aeroflex. The Aeroflex was a good camera, but it was not as good as the CM3.